This is the first lecture on economics and I find economics to be a fascinating field. It covers a lot of areas and in a way I consider this a mother of different subjects. And look at the following. <clears throat> Some of the areas that interest me are why do people migrate from one part of the world to another? What are the consequences of this action on the host country where this person has moved to and also the source country where this person comes from? And another area or a question which has, has uh, been on my focus is why are some countries richer than others? And how can poor countries or not so rich countries become richer over time? And the same question could apply to individuals as well. There are rich and poor people in every society. How can a poor person become rich? Another part, another area which really fascinates me is why do prices change? Why are they high? Why are they low? Because once we figure that out, we know we can buy goods at a lower price and probably sell them at a higher price and make more profits. Now, there are different questions in economics that we can look at. And what, I, what interests me is definitely not an exhaustive list. So what does economics encompass? And this is what I found as the most general definition of economics. And that is in the next slide. Now, economics is the study of use of scarce resources to satisfy unlimited human wants. This is the most general definition of economics that I have come across. And there are different parts of this definition which require explanation. So let me just focus on those parts. When we use the term human wants, what we have in mind are simply desires or wishes which are not constrained by financial variables like income and wealth. So all of us have our dreams and our wishes or desires. For example, I'm a professor at a university and given my salary, I cannot afford to buy a private jet plane, but I've always desired to have one and it's okay for us to desire. Now, what we find is human wants are by definition unlimited. That is, as human beings, we are never satisfied with what we have. We always want more and more. Or human beings are greedy. In economics, greediness is something we take in a positive light. Why? Because we believe a major reason as to why countries have grown so much in a material sense is simply to satisfy unlimited human wants or desires and so this is one aspect one part of the definition that you know the next one is the use of scarce resources now what are resources resources are just factors of production or inputs that we require in order to produce goods and services now, what is a good? Good is something like a tangible. You can touch and feel it. For example, tables, cars, clothing, and so on. Services are intangibles. And like you have services of a teacher, services of a hair cutter, services of an insurance agent. In any case, human wants are about goods and services. And we need inputs or factors of production or resources to produce goods and services which will be needed to satisfy unlimited human wants. 
let us look at the list of resources or factors of production or inputs and we'll use them interchangeably. The first input that we require in order to produce goods or services is labor and you can subclassify labor into unskilled, semi-skilled or skilled workers but we'll just treat labor as workers and we, as of now we'll not distinguish in them in terms of skill levels. The second resource we require in order to produce goods and services is called capital. In economics, we distinguish between what is physical capital and what is financial capital. By financial capital, we mean investment in stocks and bonds. By physical capital, we mean machines and tools. And in economics, Whenever we use the term capital, what we have in mind is physical capital or what we have in mind is machines and tools. The third resource we require in order to produce goods and services are natural resources. And natural resources would include land, water and air and all that that comes with this. This could be fish. This could be oil deposits, there could be bauxite deposits, and so on. Along with natural resources, we include buildings, which we know is a man-made resource. So third resource or factor of production is natural resources. The fourth factor of production or resource is entrepreneur. By entrepreneur, we mean owner of a business or a person who makes and is responsible for decision making in a business environment. So owners of business or managers of business are called entrepreneurs. Now look at the following. We have distinguished between labor and capital, though we very well know that both these are made up of human beings like you and me. So why do we make this distinction? The reason for this is as follows. When we use the term labor, we have in mind a person who receives instruction from somewhere and does the same thing again and again. And by this description or by this definition, I'm the professor at a university. I am classified as a worker. Why? Because the administration tells me what courses to teach and when, and that's what I do all along. On, and labor or the workers by nature are considered to be risk averse, particularly in a financial sense. And this is something you will understand or appreciate more when you contrast or compare that to the entrepreneurs. Now, entrepreneurs are people who could be considered visionaries or in a way out of tune in terms of the times that they live in. Consider a person like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs lay way back in 1960s, late 1960s. They had a dream, they had a vision and what was that vision? That everyone in this country and maybe around the world should use a machine called computers or a computing machine. In late 60s and early 70s, this seemed to be a real, real pipe dream. But look at the situation today. We just cannot live without computers. And so a major reason as to why societies change is because of this class of entrepreneurs. And this is according to me. The workers are the same everywhere, whether you look at the US, you look at Germany, you look at Burkina Faso, India, any of these countries. Workers are the same. They receive instructions and do the same thing again and again. What distinguishes one country from another, particularly when you look at the, a rich and a poor country, the difference is in the class of entrepreneurs. So that is why we distinguish between an entrepreneur and workers. Now at any point in time, look at the following. We have limited supply of resources or factors of production. And 
these resources are limited in relation to human bonds which are unlimited or in other words the resources we have are scarce in relation to unlimited human wants or the scarcity of resources so a major focus of economics is all about scarcity and how do we use these scarce resources in order to satisfy unlimited human wants is the definition of economics and whatever is scarce falls within the purview of economics and if something is not scarce it does not fall into the purview of economics for example the air that we breathe in whether it is clean or unclean is unlimited in supply and thus the air that we breathe in will not be a part of economics why because it is unlimited in supply another thing you should note is the following whenever we have scarcity that resource or good will always have a price and the price associated with workers is the remuneration of workers and we can call this wages the price associated with capital or machines let's call this rate of interest why do we use rate of interest as the price of capital the reason for this is really simple we believe most of the machines are bought by borrowed funds or through loans and the price of borrowing money is the rate of interest so indirectly rate of interest becomes the price of capital the price of natural resources and building will call this rent and the entrepreneurs corner profits so this is a systematic classification of resources and this is something we will use all along and so once again what is economics economics is how we use these scarce resources to satisfy unlimited human wants and that is the focus of economics now the subject of economics has two sub disciplines one called called macroeconomics now macroeconomics has an a and i take this to stand for aggregate so when you study or analyze the economic behavior of aggregate of people or group of people or a collection of people you are in the realm of economics and very often we use the term economy and whenever we use the term economy what we have in mind is the economic system that prevails within a well defined area for example if you want to look at the economic behavior of people living in the us what you are looking at is the us economy the other sub discipline of economics is called microeconomics micro has an i and i take this to stand for individual so what is microeconomics it is the study of individual economic behavior now when you are looking at the economic sphere and you look at different individuals they could be classified as consumers and producers or sellers so microeconomics what we do is we look at one seller or one producer or one consumer at a time and that is the subject area of microeconomics so the distinction between macro and micro is about the level of analysis in micro we look at one person at a time and in macro we look at collection of individuals at a time macroeconomics and microeconomics and then in economics we have a number of specializations and they could be on the macro side or micro side for example i'm considered an international economist because that's my in interest and i'm on the micro side so i look at one country at a time microeconomics this concludes our lecture on introduction to economics thank you for your time